Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee for October 13th, 2022. I am Andrew Johnson, and I am the chair of this committee. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Councilmember Payne. Present. Wansley. Present. Vita. Present. Chuck Tai. Present. Vice Chair Koski. Present. Chair Johnson. Present. There are six members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. Uh, with that, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. I do know we have a number of folks in community that are here today, uh, by the way, to speak uh, not on one of these items. And so normally we wouldn't open this up for uh, speaking opportunities because it was not noticed. But given that folks are already here today, what we're going to do is create space at the end of the meeting so that the folks from community who are here to speak have an opportunity to do so. And just like these other items, they'll have uh, two minutes each to speak. If, so if you are here to speak, please sign up with the clerk and uh, we will proceed with the rest of our agenda and then save that uh, for the end. So you're, you're good, thank you. Uh, so there are three items on the consent agenda, which I will read for the record. Uh, item number four is authorizing a partnership agreement with the Minnesota Department of Transportation for an outfall repair project at Taft Lake. Item number five is authorizing the submittal of a grant application to the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources for 2023 State Park Road Account Program funding. Item number six is authorizing a second budget amendment for the Lowry Hill Special Service District. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda or are there any items that anyone would like to pull for further discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have in the consent agenda is approved. Next, we are going to uh, turn to our public hearings. Our first public hearing today is the 2023 proposed services and service charges for eight special service districts and Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting on this item today. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Andrew Carlson, Project Manager, Transportation, Maintenance and Repair will be your presenter. Welcome, Mr. Carlson. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and council members. My name is Andrew Carlson, and I'm the Project Manager for Special Service Districts. Uh, previously, you may recall, we were before you on September 15th uh, to present the 2023 services and service charges for our 428A special service districts. Uh, as you may recall, this refers to the Minnesota state statute that grants municipalities the authority to establish special service districts by ordinance. Uh, all the special service districts before you today are legacy districts, uh, meaning that they predate uh, that state statute, 428A. But regardless of a district's origins, all special service districts allow property owners in a commercial area to collectively impose service charges on themselves yes. each year to create a pool of funds. These funds are directed back to the district in the form of enhanced services and special amenities. These enhanced services and special amenities are over and above what the city ordinarily provides. Each special service district is guided by an advisory board that is comprised of property owners or their representative within the district. Each advisory board recommends the services, service frequencies, estimated budget, and the service charge methodology for their respective districts. SSD service charges uh, are included on the affected property owners' regular property tax statements that are issued by Hennepin County. The funds are then transferred from the county to the city uh, and those funds then are used to procure the services described in their annual work plan. The City of Minneapolis Public Works Department implements the recommended services, most often through competitive bid contracts and th uh, through third party vendors. The City provides all advisory board administration, procurement services, contract management, financial management, and vendor performance monitoring. Advisory board members also monitor service delivery throughout the year to ensure services are meeting the expectations of property owners within each district. So for today, we have the 48th in Chicago, Central Avenue, Dinkytown, East Street, Linden Hills, Lowry Hill, Stadium Village, and Uptown Special Service Districts are all seeking approval of their 2023 proposed services and service charges. Over this past summer, Public Works staff worked with each district advisory board to recommend the services, prepare estimated budgets, and review their assessment methodologies for the coming year. 
These service charges would be collected on their 2023 real estate taxes in the same manner as special assessments. Each affected property owner was mailed a notice of public hearing, which is today, uh, with their uh, service charge amount 10 days in advance of uh, today's hearing. Staff therefore recommends the passage of a resolution approving the 2023 operating plans, special services, cost estimate, service charges, and the list of service charges for the coming year for the 40th in Chicago, Central Avenue, Dinkytown, East Street, Linden Hills, Lowry Hill, Stadium Village, and Uptown Special Service Districts, and authorizing the Department of, uh, the Department of Public Works to proceed with the work. A um, couple notes. Uh, the total investment within our public right-of-way for these eight districts is $1.3 million of annual investment. And lastly, um, I just wanted to quickly give, um, while well, it's you know, my privilege to stand here and present these budgets uh, to you today, uh, I just want you to know that there's a lot of people that are involved in the delivery of these services and the success of our special service districts. So just a couple quick shout outs, um, you know, at the risk of hopefully not forgetting anybody, but we have over 65 advisory board members across 15 districts. My colleagues, uh, Michael McLaughlin and David Bauer are uh, the, my team that I work with closely in terms of making sure we properly administer and deliver on these services. We've got Paul Keating and Matt Hannon uh, who are instrumental uh, with the um, uh, properly calculating our property service charge assessments. Uh, Peggy Menchek, of course, from the city clerk's office. We've got uh, Gene Stevens and Craig Troutman from accounting, not to mention all of our uh, wonderful uh, public works employees that help us out from time to time. In addition to that, we have all of our fantastic contractors and suppliers that are within these districts day in and day out, making sure that those uh, services are being properly delivered. Um, so with that, I stand for any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Do we have any questions from council members before we proceed to open? Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, uh, Chair Johnson. Um, I just wanted to share uh, a quick comment real quick about the special service districts. I know many of them are working in some ways, but I've also been contacted pretty regularly by business owners in my ward um, who feel as though that, of course, there's aspects that are not working to fully utilize available resources that they need in these districts. Um, one clear action I believe this body can uh, take to um, get a closer look at, you know, how we can ensure that these boards um, of these districts fully represent the diversity of folks who live and work um, every day in these neighborhoods, uh, rather than the interests of out-of-state developers um, or corporate interests, um, is, is really looking at the composition of these boards, how we can uh, truly diversify that. So I just wanted to share um, that our office will be reaching out uh, to connect with our staff to discuss steps or actions that we can take together to strengthen the community's representation through uh, the boards. Um, and I think that's a really positive next step um, in really strengthening the dynamics of our sp uh, special service district. So I at least just wanted to share that and, and let my constituents know, like I'm hearing, <laughs> hearing you, lots of concerns about these dynamics, various dynamics um, of the special service uh, districts and just want to have my comments reflect that. Thank you, council member. Any other questions before I open the public hearing? Not seeing, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and open the public hearing. Is anyone here to speak specifically to the special service districts? Anyone? Anyone not seeing any? I am going to close the public hearing for this item and we'll see if there are any comments or questions from colleagues. I will uh, just ask a question, Mr. Carlson. I know there was communication from the uh, Business Association of Dinky Town around disrepair of some of the public uh, right of way in public realm uh, and a, a frustration around when they would call 311, they'd be told, hey, this is the responsibility of the special service district. And then the special service district would say, this is the responsibility of the city. Can you speak to these uh, uh, concerns and where this is currently at? Sure, that? absolutely. Uh, Chair Johnson, council members. Uh, we had a wonderful community meeting in Dinky Town, uh, having heard from uh, some of the stakeholders uh, preceding that. So um, while uh, it's not something we do all the time, but just in terms of the uh, questions that we have been receiving, uh, we did host uh, a, a community meeting uh, in the Dinky Town Special Service District last week. Uh, uh, it was, it was um, you know, we, the, 
we always want more people to attend, but uh, the, the folks that were present, we had a, uh, a very engaging conversation. Uh, I feel like we were able to address many of their concerns and just in terms of uh, what the roles and responsibilities of the service district are. Um, it, it's not by uh, mistake that service districts are within public works. Uh, this is a department that gets things done. And uh, with our colleagues and allies within the department, as well as with our, uh, our vendors, uh, we are responsive to the needs spelled out within their annual operating plan. Um, we are extremely mindful of that um, while there's always more that can be done, uh, that comes at a cost. And we wanna make sure that we are presenting a budget that is affordable uh, to, to those rate payers. Um, in terms of responsiveness to things that are outside the purview of the service district, uh, we do um, follow up to make sure uh, with our colleagues, either within the department, uh, park board, public works, other business licensing and others that would have a, a stake in this to uh, work with them collaboratively and ensuring that those issues are addressed. So uh, we, we have uh, relationships across the enterprise uh, to ensure that these things uh, get addressed, uh, addressed in a timely fashion. All right, thank you for that. Uh, any other comments or questions on this? Uh, I'll just make the, the comment. I think it is notable that uh, a business association for this area raised these concerns. Uh, it's, you know, it falls uh, almost exclusively on businesses in these special service districts to cover these costs. I would like more uh, opportunity for engagement, but also I'm sensitive to needing to move this item forward as well. So I uh, will be forwarding this without recommendation to the council so that we have more time for uh, engaging with community as well uh, ahead of that vote. Uh, so any further comments or questions from colleagues? Not seeing any, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. And that motion carries. Uh, next, we'll move on to our second uh, item, which is a public hearing on the 2023 assessments for non-governmental tax-exempt parcel street maintenance project. Uh, Director Anderson Keller, who will be presenting this item? Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Today presenting will be Deputy Director of the Department of Public Works, Brett Jelly. Welcome, Mr. Jelly. Thank you and good afternoon, uh, Chair and committee members. My name is Brett Jelly. I'm a Deputy Director in Public Works. I am introducing two related public hearings this afternoon on non-governmental tax exempt property, street lighting and street maintenance assessments for payable 2023 taxes. Minneapolis has been assessing non-governmental tax exempt parcels for street light operations and street maintenance services since 1974. The assessment rate is determined for both assessments by dividing the budget for both street lighting and street maintenance by all assessable square footage in the city, and this ties the assessment rate to the actual cost of delivering the services. The rate for payable 2023 assessments is the same as last year, so public hearing notices were only sent to properties that were either new to the list, so uh, changed tax status this year, or their boundaries changed and their assessment uh, increased. And with that, uh, notices were mailed to just 41 properties uh, for both assessment types. There are 1,180 properties in the city that uh, uh, are assessed for these services. For street lighting operation, the median or middle value assessment for eligible properties was 40, is $43 a year. And the uh, total for the street lighting assessments for payable 2023 assessments is $104,397. For the street maintenance assessment, the median or middle value assessment for all eligible properties is $214 a year, and the total assessments for street maintenance is $521,287. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Jelly. Any questions or comments from committee members? Not seeing any, I will go ahead and open uh, the public hearing for this item. Is anyone here to speak specifically on this item? Anyone? Not seeing anyone, I will go ahead and close the public hearing uh, for this. And then uh, I am gonna see here. Yeah, we'll just uh, vote on this item first and then uh, handle the other, but we don't have a second presentation for that. So uh, any questions from committee members? Not seeing any, so I will go ahead and move approval of this item. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. 
The ayes have it, and that is uh, carried. So next we have that item considering the 2023 assessments for non-governmental tax exempt parcel street lighting operation fee project, and that was already presented on. So I'm gonna go ahead and open the public hearing for that item. Is anyone here to specifically speak on that item? I am not uh, hearing anyone, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing for that. And uh, I am going to move approval of that item. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. So the ayes have it, uh, and that item carries as well. And I know we now are gonna move to a public hearing, but before uh, we do that, I did wanna recognize a very long-standing member of the public works team, Paul Ogren. Paul, you are a complete jack of all trades uh, from your, your lengthy, amazing history here. So um, I, I wanna say a few words, but I, I'm first gonna turn it over to uh, Director Anderson Kelleher uh, real quick. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Yesterday, we got to celebrate Paul's work with a number of his colleagues. And I have to say that Paul is the type of person that you're right, he's a jack of all trades. He's also a big picture thinker. And um, he often became the person that people went to in public works when there was something that needed to be solved and maybe somebody else didn't have the bandwidth to solve it, they would give it to Paul, and Paul would solve the problem. And he's been doing that for us for 33 years. He's a resident of the city, he's raised his family in the city, he's proud of our city, and his dedication to public works, but overall to the city of Minneapolis is really extraordinary. And I too wanna to say thank you. I will miss him. Uh, he is, uh, he's just a delight to be around. He, he also, I think would want you to know if, if this isn't in uh, the note, he was into biking year round before biking year round was cool uh, for about 30 <laughs> years here. So uh, he's been, he's been uh, riding his bike and walking the talk for a long time. So I really appreciate all his work. Paul, thank you so much. Very well said, Director. Thank you so much. And Paul, just what an incredible legacy uh, at the city in all the ways. I, I have this long list of all the different ways that uh, you have touched uh, the people of our city, both the residents, the guests of our city as well. And I mean, it's, uh, I said jack of all trades because it's so expansive what you've done from overseeing the engineering laboratory and central store operations, uh, leadership for concrete and asf uh, asphalt plant operations and during the eventual removal, guiding projects through the Halloween blizzard, uh, paving construction with uh, oversight of many miles of roadways. I mean, this list just goes on and on and on. Uh, closed out financially over $250 million worth of projects covering several years, different advisory committees you've been on. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, the diversity of your work and all the ways that uh, you have moved throughout the Department of Public Works uh, and, and done uh, these vital services for the residents of our city. And so I, I'm so glad you're here to join us today. And it's uh, just thank you, thank you, thank you for all the service you've given the people of Minneapolis, the city of Minneapolis. And uh, it's, it's these bittersweet moments, right? Because um, we're sad to lose you, but also excited for uh, you in retirement as well, because if anyone has earned uh, a great retirement ahead, it, it sounds like you, Paul. So um, I would invite you to, if you, not to put you on the spot, if you have any interest in saying anything, um, please come on up. But I mean, truly, truly remarkable. So, uh, Thank you, Chair Johnson and committee members. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, not only have I grown professionally here, but personally I've raised a family. Uh, the city has given me enormous opportunities. And so it's been a pleasure, it's been fun. Uh, there's good days and the bad days, but you know what, so many more good days. And we're all doing good. Uh, I wanna thank the city for giving me this opportunity, giving me the resources to raise a family here and the ability to uh, just do really remarkable work with a great bunch of people, from yourself and all your predecessors and all the predecessors. 
and themselves. So anyway, thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Paul. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. Excellent. All right. Well, before we adjourn today, we are going to open up uh, to hear from the public. We know we have a number of community members here uh, that are interested in speaking. And so uh, we do ask that folks please uh, sign in with the clerk. I will uh, call from the list that uh, we have folks signed up. And then if you're not signed up, I will ask at the end if anyone uh, who would like to speak is also here. And then please, if you can, limit uh, your uh, testimony or what you have to say to two minutes a person. So the first person is Michelle Gross. I'm going to go ahead and open this uh, forum, this public hearing. Welcome, Michelle. And then after Michelle, we have Keith. Yes, if you want to stand up, you can. You want to just come forward? Sure. That way we speed things up a little bit, too. Sure. Sure. Council members, my name is Michelle Gross. I am the president of Communities United Against Police Brutality. I'm here to talk today about something that is deeply disturbing to individuals in our community, which is the constant um, um, eviction of the encampments and the small camps around our city. Last Thursday, we saw the eviction of three encampments that literally put about 120 people back on the streets with nowhere to live. And when I tell you that, they little, the police literally walked up, slashed the tents with knives. You could not, if you didn't like something I was doing in my house, you couldn't take a wrecking ball to my wall and seize, seize my property. They slashed the tents. They took these people's property illegally um, and in violation of a, a recent decision by the um, state supreme, or the yeah, the state supreme court in the ACLU case. And not only did they do that, but now they've got these people wandering the streets and telling, and the police are telling people, if you are east of 27, east of Bloomington on 27th Street, we will arrest you, merely for standing there, not for violating the law or anything. You know, I don't know if people expect unsheltered homeless people to simply vanish, to evaporate. I don't know what people expect, but we didn't, you know, that day, that happened, and then I know that, um, that Marvina's going to talk about what also happened, which is that a halfway house for um, um, people on parole who are, you know, working, they've paid rent and everything like that, um, suddenly those folks were evicted from their housing that very same day. And suddenly, and on, and on only the, night, the notice from 5 o'clock the night before. So now we had 32 more people made homeless. We called the shelters, we called the shelter hotline to see if there were any beds available. There was not a single bed available in the city of Minneapolis. There were two beds available in Minnetonka. This is not solving the problem. What we are asking for is for the city to place a moratorium on evictions for a year. People are saying to us, oh, we're coming up with solutions and things. We know it's a complicated problem. We know the solutions take time. But rather than making people wander the streets cold with no property, having their, you know, their medications, their, their um, papers, their money, their means of being warm, rather than taking those things and leaving people to wander the street, which is far more dangerous than any encampment, we need a moratorium. Thank you. Thank you. And then... Councilmember Payne, are you good for a moment? Or I, I know I, I'm just going to quick announce. I know Councilmember Payne did have a another another. You're you're good, and um, I know you had, had another commitment. So I just want to acknowledge that. If you see him sure. take off, it's he told me this Wait, before the meeting. So. Perfect. Kind of no, yeah, no, no. He he let me know beforehand. So um, Keith is next. Okay, right. my name is Marvina Haynes. Okay, sorry. Perfect. Yes, yes. No. yes Marvina, not, welcome. Okay. So my name is Marvina Haynes. Um, I'm the president of Minnesota Wrongfully Convicted Judicial Reform. October 5th, around 5 p.m., I got a call that 40 of the formerly incarcerated um, residents at Better Future Great River Landing were going to be displaced. They got told by their parole officer that they had 24 hours to move with no resources available to them. We scrambled all night to find these people these formerly incarcerated residents, um, temporarily housing. Also, Better Future employed the residents at $13.50 an hour. Um, we were able to get some of them jobs. Um, and also, we had legal representation to advocate for them to try to see what's the best way to 
handle this situation. Um, we haven't had accountability from Better Futures, which are Greater um, Greater River Landing. The DOC has ha had no, Hennepin County has no one has had no accountability for these actions. Displacing these men hurt our community. Um, we are asking for their deposit to be returned immediately. Um, resources for them um, and. Um, a whole list of other things um, to be able to stabilize these formerly incarcerated men because they didn't do any violations to have this affect their life in this type of way. Um, and no one's talking to us. So I know that Hennepin County, like you said, handles this matter, but you guys are the city and we're asking you guys to hold people accountable and to figure out what's going on and to assist these men because they were trying to stabilize their life. Better yet, half of them were on level three and level four phases. The program only phased out to level four. They were promised housing assistance, um, housing vouchers, a whole list of things, and now they have no direction on what way to turn or even a solution for their life at this time. Mm. And all of this happened on the same day. They displaced hundreds of families in our community. Thank you. And, Thank you. and I should mention that um, these folks, like I said, they were rent payers. They yep. were, you know, all of this kind of yep. stuff. They, have, and they, had, they were told that if they did not leave Great River Landing, they'll return to jail. Day, they would be taken back to prison. Yeah. Mm. They, they had contracts. They had a contract with the um, property itself, a lease that their probation officers made them violate. They had a contract with Better Futures, which is a reentry program that was violated. They have a contract with. Hennepin County Parole Office that was violated. Please stand with us and help figure out how to help this housing crisis that has been put upon our community. Thank you, thank you. And I know council members up here are taking notes as well, by the way. Uh, next we have Kat. I think he's Keith. Oh, yeah, Keith. Hi. Keith. Yeah, it's okay. Thank, thank you, uh, Council Chair Johnson and council members for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Keith McCarran, I'm a resident in Minneapolis, and my sole reason for speaking today is just concern for the most vulnerable segment of our society and what the city of Minneapolis is doing to that population. I have no illusions of white saviorism. So with that, I would say that I don't understand in the light of the way that the Minneapolis Police Department is trying to reestablish trust in the community mm -hmm. and under two consent decree rulings coming up, why they would take this kind of aggressive, brutal activity against mm -hmm. citizens of the city. The other thing that I'm concerned about is in, in light of the ruling of federal justice right, who ruled that the city cannot damage people's property and cannot force them to abandon their property. That is clearly what was taking place. And that relates back to this committee because the public works and the street department were highly involved in damaging and destroying and, and uh, causing people to abandon property. I also would bring to memory a former employee, Al Diddy, who worked for sanitation, who under the Jamar Clark occupation was forced to go in at police directive and do something that does not fall within his purvey of his job, and he ended up committing suicide as a result. So these traumatic things have very real uh, effects, consequences on citizens, and despite the fact that people want to not see these people in our community and want them to just vanish and disappear. They're here, they're, they're residents, they're citizens, and I would like that to be respected. Thank you. Thank you. And Kat? Thank you for allowing me a chance to speak. Um, I am a resident of Minneapolis. Um, <clears throat> I am here to address the fact that Public Works does work in conjunction with MPD, um, harassing 
unhoused residents of this city. Um, they did use their own materials, front loaders, bobcats. They were heavily involved in destroying people's uh, property. Um, I would also like to mention that people, this isn't just, this is complete cruelty because people literally laugh and smile while they are destroying people's belongings, destroying their medications, laughing in their faces and not allowing them to retrieve their stuff, stealing their property because people got property to start doing jobs, snow removal, all this shit taken from them, spirited away somewhere. They don't know where it is. They won't tell them. That is beyond wrong. And the, it's, the winter is coming. But in saying that um, it's undignified and I don't want to see people out in the streets, the it's really not about you do something then to take care of these people and of spending all of this budget mm-hmm. on militarizing the police. I saw 17 squad cars in a half mile radius along with militarized golf carts, whatever they're called. There's like five of them in a half mile radius. Why is all this money going to this instead of taking care of the people that are in this city? I do not understand it, and I don't understand why public works needs to be involved in terrorizing our most vulnerable, targeted people in this city. I, our taxpayer, I, I pay taxes here. I do not want to pay to watch my neighbors get killed and lose their shit. Three people are dead already mm-hmm. because of this. Yes. Many, many overdoses. Last week and a half. In the last week and a half. The numbers went up. And it's going, it's, a, it's going to be snowing tomorrow. It's going to be really cold. Where, what are people supposed to do? And they fucking forced an eviction again. There was like, what, two, three the other day? Yeah. That's not doing anything. If you really care, put, get, there are resources. I know the city has the money. I've seen the budgets. Put the money towards the community. Stop giving it to organizations that are laundering and filtering the money for their own purposes. Give it to the fucking community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ron? Is Ron here? I'm sorry, what name did you say? Ron? Hello, Ron. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity to... uh, be able to share some comments with you today. My name is Ron Wetzel, W-E-T-Z-E-L-L. Look, right there, on the street corners, in the alleys, under the overpasses, at the exit ramps, what we don't want to see are sons and daughters, our nieces and nephews, our aunts and uncles, our grandparents. They are our unhoused, lost relatives trying to find their way home. They end up in the streets because it is a policy of the city of Minneapolis that unhoused camps are not allowed on public or private property. When a camp appears, it is the practice of the city to inform residents that they are there illegally and are subject to eviction. Then, without further notice or announcement, the city shows up one morning, informs residents they must leave immediately, can take only what they can carry. And the rest of their belongings are loaded up into dump trucks and hauled away as garbage. Residents then are left to flounder in search of a new location and a way to replace what possessions they had. The city's policy regarding the unhoused is in you may. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Angel. So, anyways, uh, I'd like everyone just to 
a minute of silence or 30 seconds for all we lost, but for all that we can gain. Ron, I appreciate you. Thank you for all you said. Um, this is what I have to say is that we have prison systems for a reason, but if you don't want people to repeat their behaviors and their habits, maybe you should um, act appropriately or give them the appropriate skills to make sure that they're not homeless one minute. What are you going to do when you're homeless? You don't have nothing. You're going to go back to your old ways because it was easier. Mm -hmm. It was better, quicker, faster money. These nonprofits at the city, state, county, I have no idea. They're all the same. I've done my research. My research is developers. You want to develop something? Develop the state of Minnesota. Develop the people here. Develop the community here. Make a change. Make a change, you guys. Come on, like something has to change. There has to be a difference. There's three spots in the great city of Minneapolis. They're absolutely doing nothing with. We understand there's people with mental illness. Illness. We understand there, you know, theft. We get that, we're realistic. But to continue just to let it be on the streets and to, to blame people for this or that is not good. My words are all jumbled and boggled because last time I was here, I say you guys, the city, whoever decided to take every single thing I owned, mm. as they're welcoming me to, to come up here and speak, they're taking it all away. I don't know if anybody noticed or not, but I came back 27 minutes later and just snapped and started throwing random garbage on you know, the railway, and that's not good behavior. You know what I mean? That's kind of, you know, unrealistic behavior. Everybody knows that. But what I do know is a mother's love is unbelievable. And what I do know is that every resident in the state of Minnesota needs to come to grips with one thing. There needs to be a change. Mm -hmm. This is broken. The old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, it's broke. Let's do something. We're not going to fix it maybe in our lifetime. Let's mend it. You know what I mean? Please, somebody, Mayor Fry, somebody from Hennepin County, anybody, give me 33 seconds of their time and listen, and I guarantee you that there'll be some type of positive change with the people that are living on the streets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm gone. Thank you. I uh, I'm going to look to our clerk. Do we, do we have anyone else signed up to speak? No, I, I just so, want to uh, mention I, something, if it's okay. Uh, briefly, I, really briefly, honestly. I, okay. All right, well, honestly. yeah. Um, the reality is this, before the pandemic, 40% of middle, people who considered themselves middle class were asset poor, which means that they were one paycheck away from becoming homeless. Mm -hmm. After the pandemic, it's now 59%. I think that's a real reality for people. The way that we help people stabilize their lives is not by making them move every 10 minutes because the police decide that some place is an eviction with no notice and things like that. This is not the way. I want to thank you all for being the most respectful. Mm -hmm. We have been yes. trying to get attention at this uh, about this issue this entire week and starting last week. You all are the first people to actually sat and listened to us yes. for a change and didn't try to get rid of us, um, unlike what happened yesterday, by the way. Um, and the point is, is this. This can be anybody's problem. You know, I happen to have a house right now, but you know, I'm on social security. I don't know what's gonna happen. I might run out of money and lose my house. We, all of us are vulnerable. All of us are vulnerable. And we have to not let this type of conduct happen to our neighbors. You know, living in, a, in, a, um, in an encampment is not ideal, but it's a hell of a lot more ideal than wandering around with your stuff in your hands or nowhere. No blankets, no nothing, and sleeping in a doorway. It is way better. It's, that's, people form these encampments because it's safety in numbers. Please, please put a moratorium on the shutdown of these encampments for at least a year to yes. give this city an opportunity to build the appropriate resources and housing for people. Please bring it into these encampment um, shutdowns. Thank you. Thank you. And before we adjourn, I want to see if there's anyone else who didn't sign up that is interested in speaking. Anyone else not seeing any? So I'm gonna go ahead and close this opportunity and thank folks for coming down, even though this wasn't on the printed agenda. We do, I know I can speak for my colleagues in saying it's really important for us to hear from community members. And it always means something when folks come down to City Hall because we know it's not always easy, especially, uh, you know, as, as it can 
folks live, you know, miles away and it's, it's hard to get down here in the day for a lot of folks too. So we appreciate that. Uh, we have no further business before this committee. So without any objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you.